have a Bible with you, please look on with the person uh, next to you. Follow along in the Scripture as we study together. Also, if you aren't with us Thursday night, Wade and Carrie are expecting a blessing. Expecting a new church member. And so, uh, Amen. So we thank the Lord for that. Keep them in your prayers and, and, uh, and so that. All right, Galatians chapter number one. The Bible says in verse number three, "Grace be to you." Galatians one three and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at this phrase: "Who gave Himself for our sins? Who gave Himself for?" our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Let's pray. Lord, with all my heart, I ask You to help me this morning to tell the greatest truth that's ever been told in a way that is understandable to those that have come this way. Father, I pray this morning for each one that is sitting in this auditorium, that you would open the eyes of their understanding, that you would enlighten them and enable them to see, to comprehend and to believe this greatest truth that's ever been proclaimed to mankind. Help us, Lord God, please, in this hour. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Let's just start off with a bang. You are a sinner. That phrase doesn't begin services in a mega church, but it begins services in a Bible believing church. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Scripture says, There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, being sinners, the Scripture then says, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, if all men are sinners, if all women are sinners, there isn't one man or one woman that can free you from your sin. There isn't one man or one woman that can pay the penalty you owe God because of your sin. So the whole human race is in one boat together, in a sinking ship called sin, with no way of escape. They can't help one another. They can't all work together and pull through. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone comes short of the glory of God. And so there is no Savior for sinners. If they all got together and started a religion, it would be the work of man and couldn't save them. If they all got together and started a reform movement, it would be the work of man and couldn't save them. Man can't save man, because all men are sinners. But the Bible says in the book of Romans that God, but God. Those may be, those may be the finest words in Scripture. But God. Just say everything you want to say about man, but God. Commendeth His love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The just dying for the unjust that He might bring us to God. Why? We can't get to God on our own. No man could bring us to God. So God came to this earth in a body of flesh. They called His name Jesus. He lived without sin. Thirty-three and one half years, and then, and here's how the tale is told, and then he was killed and hanged on a cross. But the Scripture tells it very differently. The Scripture says that he gave himself for our sins. Had Roman soldiers killed Jesus, it would have been one more sin against God. One more crime on the part of humanity. Had temple guards dragged Jesus against His will to a mock trial, and then mobs forced Him outside of the city against His will, 
And then men held him down and, and forced his hands in place as they nailed them to that cross. You would have had one more martyr for a noble cause. Or one more frail human overcome by more powerful humans, but you would still have no Savior. Had Jesus died against His will, trying to stay alive, trying to preserve Himself, He'd just be one more in a long list of sons of Adam struggling to make it another 24 hours. But if Jesus came into this world intending to die. If Jesus came into this world to voluntarily die. If Jesus came into this world to lay down His life by an act of His own will, not something forced upon Him by sinful man against His will, that would be first and foremost proof of God's love. And in addition to that, and praise be to his name, if someone without sin died in the place of a sinner, then that sinner would have a substitute who had paid for the sins of the sinner so that the sinner could have hope of standing before God, not not without ever having sinned, but standing before God with the penalty for that sin already paid, so that the sinner would not have to pay. So the Bible says that Jesus gave Himself. How about that? He gave Himself. He wasn't overcome. He wasn't overwhelmed. He wasn't put to death. He offered himself as a voluntary sacrifice, as a proof of God's love, as a payment for man's sin, so that you have not a martyr to look up to or another dead man with whom to sympathize, but a Savior who took your place. Turn your Bible to John chapter number 10. John chapter 10, and let's take a look at some remarkably curious words spoken by Jesus Christ. You know, all through his life, people wanted to kill him. He was, he was hardly out of his swaddling clothes. When the decree went forth to kill all the babies in and around the place of Jesus' birth and childhood, all of those infants slaughtered by governmental authorities just to make sure that Jesus was dead. Why, no sooner did a sinless man arrive in a sinful world than Satan, the murderer from the beginning, went about trying to kill him. How many times in the Gospels did they take up stones to stone him and couldn't raise their arms to toss them? How many times in Scripture did a mob surround Jesus and he just passed through the midst of them and went his way? Oh, they wanted him dead. Oh, they wanted him silenced. They wanted to be rid of him, but obviously, evidently, these mobs of hateful men had no power to kill him. How then did he end up dead? It must have been a will greater than the will of sinful man. It must have been a design and an objective superior to that of angry mobs and jealous religious leaders. The Bible says in John 10, Jesus is speaking in the 17th verse, And he says, therefore, doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Now watch, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Jesus is speaking prophetically. He knows the cross awaits. He knows he's going to die on Mount Calvary. He knows he's going to be nailed to that tree. He knows that. But he says in advance, 
No man is going to do that to me. I am going to do that for man. He goes on to say, I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 8, if you, if, you, if you would turn there, you would read these words. No man has power in the day of death. If today, today, if God has determined that you have 15 more years to walk this earth, you cannot sit on that pew and will yourself into heaven. You do not have the power to bring death to bear upon your mortal existence. So I could get a gun, I could get a rope, I could... Have you not read in Revelation where the Bible says that during the torments of that tribulation time, men will seek death and not be able to find it? You don't have the power. You don't have the power of death. You don't have the power to, to die if God says live. You don't have the power to depart if God says stay. Right. Right. In like manner, if death were to come this afternoon and knock on your door and say, I want to take a ride. He's just being polite. If you say no, you're going anyway. Man. Right. You don't have power. You have no say in the matter when death comes your way. But here the Lord Jesus Christ, He went out, <coughs> went out there to Calvary. They nailed Him to that cross. Look, you know who He is? He's Almighty God. He's the life. First John says He's eternal life. He could be hanging on that cross Today, outside Jerusalem, 2,000 years later, as alive as he was when they put him up there, if he didn't choose to die. And if he had chosen to die one night safe and secure in his bed, he could have just dismissed his spirit then, as well as on the cross, and never gone through all that agony of Calvary. But he came into this world to die. Hear me. He didn't come to start a religion. He didn't come to set an example. He didn't come to say some pretty things that could be misquoted by political figures. He came to die for your sins and for mine. And so when the hour came, the hour came to pay for the sins of the whole world, these men, one man thought he was betraying Jesus, who I'll sneak around and nobody will know what I'm doing. It was already foretold in detail in Psalm 109. The price to be paid was already told in Jeremiah. The deed done was spelled out in Zechariah. Judas hadn't come up with a plan. He was playing a part scripted long ago that someone would betray the Son of God. Peter's denial, the disciples abandoning the Lord and and fleeing for their lives, all prophesied, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The mock trial before Pilate, the mob crying for his blood, the manner of his death, the day and hour of his death, the word spoken when he died. All of them written hundreds and thousands of years in advance in the pages of the Old Testament. Inspired by the very God who stood in a body of flesh with that cross on his shoulder, that crown of thorns on his brow, and walked up that hill having come to do that very thing which he himself had foretold. This is not something men did to Jesus. This is something Jesus scripted before He ever came to earth. Right. Right. As the means whereby your sin could be paid for, my sin could be paid for, and our souls could be saved. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9. It has been probably 25 years or more since I have watched any of the movies about Jesus. 
And the reason I find them so difficult to watch is uh, not just because they try to make Jesus out to be some guy that just left Woodstock. (laughs) But because they always portray either Jewish priests or Roman soldiers or the two of them conspiring together, killing poor little Jesus who just couldn't get away. I don't know why they couldn't take time to read the Bible. There's nothing like that in the Word of God. First of all, there's no poor little Jesus. Second of all, there's no trying to get away. The Bible says in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, It came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, He took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as He prayed, the fashion of His countenance was altered, and His raiment was white and glistering. And behold, the talk with Him two men which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his what? Decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. There's never been a death like this. This is the only death in history that was an accomplishment, not a failure. We've all lost loved ones. They, they print some sort of uh, form, a death certificate, and it'll say on there, cause of death, heart failure, liver failure, kidney failure, massive trauma caused overall failure. It's always failure. The doctor comes out, says we did everything we could do, but he didn't make it. The family gathers around and says, she fought a noble fight, but she didn't make it. We always view death as the enemy that wins in the end. But somebody showed up that death had never encountered before. Somebody showed up who was without sin and therefore without any fear. Without sin and therefore without any condemnation. Without fear and therefore fully manifesting the power of Almighty God. Laying in that manger wrapped in swaddling clothes that looks strangely like a body prepared for the burial. The baby Jesus looked death in the eye and said, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. At 12 years old, as he taught in the temple, and astonished the doctors and the lawyers, and amazed those that heard him speak such, such words from a 12-year-old boy. On his way out of that synagogue, he looked at death and gave it a wink and said, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming for you. They took him out to the brow of a hill and tried to cast him out, and he said, not yet, but wait right there, I'll be back. And as Jesus drank that bitter cup in Gethsemane's garden, as Jesus made his way out with all that rabble rabble shouting and the women behind him crying and then the mob at the foot of the cross yelling crucify him and then shifting gears and saying come down and we'll believe through all of it. Jesus set his face like a flint and said to death for the first time, oh buddy, you're not going to be the winner. I'm going to be the winner. I came to die on my terms. And when this day's through, I'm going to shut you down. Amen. He came to accomplish death. Why, if you got bad news from the doctor, I don't care how saved you are, fear is going to visit you. If they said we're calling in the caretakers and, and, and you, you're going to run your last lap in this race, I don't care how many songs you sing about going to heaven, there's something down inside you that's more than a little uneasy. <laughs> Jesus put his hand right there on that cross and said, go ahead, get it done. Put his other hand on that cross and said, go ahead and get it done. And they lifted him up upon that cross and he looked death Right in the eye. Said you're just about to lose. He came to die. 
He didn't come to avoid it. He didn't come to escape it. He didn't hang on as long as he could. He came to die. Look back in your Bible to John chapter 18. John chapter number 18. And so what about those soldiers? You know, they came out there and they arrested him and they uh, bound his hands and they put that blindfold on him and did all those things to him. Well, yeah, they, they did do all that. You do know it was with consent. Not consent of the government. Consent of the one who one day will place the government upon his shoulder and rule the whole world. John 18, verse number 1. Judas also which betrayed him, or 2, verse 2. Betrayed him to the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then having received a band of men... And officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Mob, armed mob, trained fighting men and their officers coming to get a preacher in the middle of the night. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, ran and hid. Look, what are they doing? They're coming to arrest him. He's been betrayed. They're going to kill him. He walks right out to meet them. It's like he plans on dying. Because he does plan on dying. He didn't say, okay, you guys form a circle around me. I'm going to slip out of here. Now, in, in, in prior incidents, he slipped out. On prior occasions, he took off. But this time, this time, look, they're already coming to the altar. Thank you, brother. Is that in the name of a prophet? But this time, Jesus walks out to meet them. Look at it. Uh, verse number uh, four says, Jesus, therefore, know all things that come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. How about that? Now, let me ask you something. If Jesus Christ, by the word of his power, lays out all these armed men, which one of them arrested him if he did not want to be arrested? Which one of them bound his hands if he did not want his hands to be bound? Which one of them put the blindfold on him if he did not want to be blindfolded? Not only could they not have killed him had he not been willing to die, they couldn't have laid a finger on him. There'd have been no Pilate's judgment hall. There'd have been no Herod's interrogation had Jesus not subjected himself to their will. Because he came to die. Turn your Bible to Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. By the way, next time you're watching that religious TV, keep this in mind. I'll wait till you're through turning the pages. I don't want you to miss what I'm about to say. Next time you're watching that religious TV, keep this in mind. In the Bible, every friend of God falls forward to their knees to worship Him, every enemy of God who is opposing His will falls backward. That's in the Bible. So the only way you could miss it is if you were watching carnival sideshows on religious TV instead of reading your Bible. If you're reading your Bible, you'd know that when you saw it. If you were watching that, you wouldn't know the Bible when you saw it. So why do you have to say those things? So you don't get deceived. These soldiers fell backward to the ground. Why? They're the enemies of the Lord. It's that way all through the Bible. All right. Matthew 26. Take a look at this. They come out to get him. 
And 51, behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. I used to wonder about it. So, well, you know, well, Peter, he's not very good with that sword. How do you swing a sword at a guy and cut off his ear? Well, brave sword swinging Peter, the guy's laying on the ground. <laughs> They thought this was going to be a mop-up operation. And Jesus said, no, 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 put the sword away. Healed the man. Now look at verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Twelve legions of angels. Back in Hezekiah's day, an army of 185,000 men was coming to sack Jerusalem. God sent one angel. One angel killed 185,000 men. Let's suppose all the angels have equal strength. There's no muscle angels and skinny angels and fit angels and... Old fogey angels, let's suppose all the angels are just as strong. If one killed 185,000, you know how many men 12 legions of angels could kill? 13.2 billion. That's more than everybody that's lived from Adam to the present day. Every person that's ever lived in 6,000 years of human history, all Jesus had to do was say, Come help me! And everybody that had died, everybody that had lived, everybody that would live, he could have killed them all. Instead, he sought to give life to them all. Amen. And so he kept the angels standing down and went voluntarily to his death. Why? Because that's what he came to do. He came to die. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Now watch. And gave Himself for it. See that? He wasn't killed for it. He gave himself for it. He wasn't murdered or martyred for it. He gave himself for it. How? How can this woman live? I will take the bullet for her. I will take the hit for her. I will die that she might live. That's the kind of love that God wants a man to have for his wife. That's the kind of love a, a wife wants her husband to have for her. And the Bible says if you ever did see that, it would just be a little teeny tiny picture of what Jesus Christ did for the whole world. He took the wrath of God for us. He died so we could live. Want to see it again? Titus chapter number 2. Timothy, Titus, Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 verse 11. Titus 2 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Verse 14, uh, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. How about that? Redemption. Something, something is in the pawn shop. Something is in heart. You don't have the money to buy it back. You don't have the money to redeem it. You don't have the means whereby to recover and restore that thing. And the man that has this, I'm not giving it up unless you pay that much. 
So I can't pay that much. Well, if somebody showed up and gave you the money, then you could go in, pay that man, get that thing out, redeem it, restore it, take it home where it belonged. But you don't have the money. Now here we are. We're in bondage to sin. Right? We're all sinners. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Wages of sin is death. So death says, I'll not free these sinners unless somebody pays my price. What's your price? The death of a sinless one. (laughs) I got it. I got it. (laughs) Because all have sinned. Here comes a priest, he's sinned. Here comes a high priest, he's sinned. Here comes a prophet, he's sinned. Here comes a disciple, he's sinned. Here comes an apostle, he's sinned. Bring them on. You're not getting these sinners because all you got to offer is the death of sinners. You can't pay my price. You don't get these dead people. So one day God says, tell you what, I'm going to get up off this throne I'm going to put on a body of human flesh. I'm going to die as a sinless man. And I will pay the price required by death and set them all free. And one day death is sitting there in that pawn shop, leaned back in that chair with his feet on the desk. And in come Mary and Joseph with this baby. Hey, Mary, is that your boy? Yeah. Joseph, that's your son? Uh-uh. Well, Mary, what have you been doing? You've been immoral? Joseph said, I wouldn't be with her if she'd been immoral. I had a mind to put her away privily. But angel showed up and said, better not. I said, what are you talking about? Didn't you remember that I promised the seed of the woman would bruise your head? This is for death, this is the first baby you've ever seen that didn't come from the seed of a man. But from a seed that the Holy Ghost put inside a woman. Death, you're about through. We'll be back. <clears throat> Quick, go kill all the babies. Shoo, that baby's gone down to Egypt where they couldn't find it. Thirty-three and one-half years later, Jesus Christ walked back into that shop and he said, Hey, death, I'm here to pay your price. I'll kill you. No problem. What do you mean, no problem? I've never said that to anybody and had them say, No problem. I'll kill you by crucifixion. Yeah, that's kind of what I counted on. What? Death had no idea that one day a man who knew no sin would bruise his heel by wounding the head of death's murdering emissary. And when Jesus was through on that cross, Satan's power was broken principalities and powers scattered and the Lord and His host could cry triumphantly, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? you got to turn them loose. No, look, it wasn't long after Jesus cried, it is finished and gave up the ghost that your Bible says the graves of many saints were opened and they showed themselves alive. What happened? Redemption. Redemption. Somebody had paid the price. My friends, I'm telling you today, had men killed Jesus... It'd just be one more noble death in history. But if Jesus voluntarily laid down his life and died, his death was the death of death. You get that? The Bible says in Ephesians 4, he triumphed over them openly in his death. 
Nobody else's death was a triumph. But his was. His was. And so the Bible says now of the saved man, the saved woman. (laughs) Yea, though I walk through the valley, not of death. The valley of the shadow of death. If I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that means I'm here and death's over there. Its shadow may fall upon me. Can't hurt me. I, I, I go to these uh, aquariums. Some I've been to some of these aquariums. And you stand right here. And right there, right there, like three or four feet away. Big shark. Big shark, big mouth, big teeth. Mean little eyes swimming right towards you. And you just stand there. Look at that shark. Ooh, that's a big shark. That shark tear your arm off. That shark bites your foot off. That shark eat half your surfboard. Why are you standing right there three feet from a shark and you're not afraid? Because that shark is just as strong and just as powerful as it's ever been. But there's something keeping it away from you. So you may observe it. And comment upon it and be fascinated by it without being afraid of it. And here I stand. And there's my Savior Jesus Christ and the precious blood that He shed to wash my sins away. And I look at death in the funeral home. And I look at death at the graveside. And I look at death in the hospital. And I look at death approaching as, as my body begins to, to wear away. And I look at it and it's powerful and it's strong and it's scary and it's fascinating. But it can't get me. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'm not scared of it anymore. There's something holding it back. One of these days, you might enter through the door called cancer, or the door called old age, or the door called tragic accident, or the door called I never thought she'd really do it. But one day, <laughs> one day, you're going to walk through that door and be surprised to find You're walking by and looking at it. And it's snarling and growling and raging, but it can't get you. Because you have the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, the Bible says, Jesus didn't come into this world and die. He came into this world and gave Himself. In death to pay for our sins. The voluntary sacrifice of the sinless Savior satisfied the demands of a holy God and nullified the claims that death had upon the sinner and enables you to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. For thou art with me. You have a Savior. To escort you right through the whole process and into the presence of God in heaven. That's what it means to be saved. It means somebody saved you and saved you from something. So when we say we're saved, what we mean is that Jesus Christ came into this world, took care of sin, took care of death, satisfied God Almighty. So that now we walk through this life and we walk through the end of our life and we walk through that door called death without fear, without dread, without uncertainty because we know our Savior has forgiven us and we know our God is satisfied through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now what do you have? Baptism? Membership, catechism, confirmation, good deeds. That's not what death demands. You can't be redeemed with any of that. It takes the death of a sinless man. So the only Redeemer is Jesus Christ. Nobody else can pay the required price. 
Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? If not, you need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful today that Jesus came to prove your love, to manifest his power, not by saving himself from death, but by dying that we might be saved. Father, if there's one here today, good, moral, decent, religious, but trusting something besides the required payment, the death of Jesus Christ, Father, save that soul today, we ask, we pray, we plead with you to save that soul. Lord, may your people Leave today with a greater appreciation of their Savior than they had when they came.